Hello, I'm Bill O'Donnell and welcome to another program on spirituality. I'm indeed thrilled to have finally in the studio my old friend Denis Cope, uh, who wrote a terrific book called Dying, A Natural Process. Now before you run or turn the channel, uh, I want you to know I've read this book. It's a terrific book. It's something we all need to know about. Uh, Denis is a registered nurse and a hospice nurse specialist, and she has done us all a favor by bringing us up to speed on something we all need to know something about, because it's going to happen to all of us eventually, and it's happening right now as we speak. So welcome, Denis. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bill. Uh, this is a terrific book. Um, it is not sad somehow. Reading about de death and dying was not sad reading this book. And I don't know how you did that, but it, it came out that way. Well, I feel it's a gift that came through me. It's yeah. a gift that came through me. And I've had people tell me that one fellow sent me an email and said once he'd read that, and his mother was in the process of dying, that once he had read this, that he found that he gave up his fear and he gave up his anger. Mm -hmm. And he was able to move into being with her. So. Yeah. It's, it's a gift that came through me. It's great. Uh, before we get into the book, tell us a bit about your background and how you got into this kind of work. I've been a hospice nurse. When I look back over my life and my nursing career, clearly I've been working with end-of-life issues for years. I did dialysis for 14 years, and as I said, I've done hospice. I did some coronary care. And what I realized when I started looking back, and as a hospice nurse, <clears throat> I realized that the most important thing I was doing with the families more than working with pain control and making them comfortable and teaching them how to turn somebody, was teaching them what the dying process was so that they would then be able to line up with what was happening and not be afraid of it. So often people think things are going wrong and they've got to fix what's happening rather than understanding it's part of the natural process and how can I support what's happening. Mm -hmm. So I decided, and the other thing is that we usually talk about the dying process directly with the family, the steps of it, about two weeks before the person has died, and they've already gone through months of this process. I also observed, as I was doing hospice nursing, that the dying process parallels pregnancy and birth. So that there's actually, as I see it, a pregnancy to the dying phase, about six to nine months out, you can see it start to happen and then it moves on and then about a month out the labor starts there's a transition phase just as in the birth process and then there's the deathing instead of the birthing mm -hmm. and it's very predictable and in fact midwives who have gone into hospice said this is just like this is just like pregnancy and birth so and it is it's a type of birthing mm -hmm. uh, it's a real healthy way to look at it Tell people if they're not familiar with the term hospice, tell them what hospice is and what happens in a hospice setting for people. Hospice is a concept more than anything. Uh, Dame Cicely Saunders in England back in the mid-60s when I was in nursing school and I remember articles being written about her doing developing this thing called hospice in England and I was fascinated. It's the only professional journal article that I remember reading as a student nurse. It's the only one I recall. Um, she found, she said, there needs to be a place where people who are dying can be living up till the time they die. Instead of having to get into a bed and be sick, they could walk around, they can enjoy the gardens, and they could get support for being at the end of their life. And so hospice provides that support. And we have three or maybe four, but for th sure, three hospices here in town. They've just opened up some beds at the hospital for end-of-life care. Um, so it's a supportive care for people who are counting their lives in months rather than years. Okay. And it can be done in the home or it can be done in a nursing home or um, the beds at the hospital are for the very end there. And for people who in the hospital, all of a sudden things are turning to the direction where the family knows they're not going to be leaving the hospital alive. Mm -hmm. So where can they go and get support for that process rather than being in a regular medical setting? Mm -hmm. That brings up a point. I've, I've been uh, in the intensive care unit and I've seen people in, in, in their care of the end of days. Yeah. And my own sister, who's an intensive care nurse, was here for our 10th anniversary show, Nancy. And she told us that as her role as an intensive care nurse, she says, 
I'm actually prolonging their suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunate, isn't it? And yet the hospice is there to alleviate that suffering. They've accepted the fact that the natural process is happening and they're moving on and they're not doing the heroic mm -hmm. efforts to keep them alive. Right. Can you talk about the distinction between the two and how those decisions are made when somebody knows they're ready for hospice or they should be in the intensive care trying to save their life? Well, you know, it's a very, very complex picture, as we all know, and, you know, we recently went through the Terry Schiavo thing and, you know, the, the difficulty with that decision, and evidently they're going through it in England right now with a baby named Charlotte. Um, it's a hard call, and it's very complex, but basically if a physician and the family understand that a person is counting their life in months, weeks, days, and that turning their disease process around or whatever's wrong with them around is not in the cards, then having supportive what they call palliative care is something that should be looked at. Palliative care being what? Palliative care, they, the, they differentiate between curative care and palliative care. Palliative care being comfort care. Mm. Well, I think all care is comfort care, whether you're in a <laughs> palliative situation or not. But basically, there's curative where you are looking at resolving the disease process that's going on with you. Um, if it's a cancer, putting it in remission. If it's a heart disease, certainly getting some support so that your heart will go better longer. Mm -hmm. And um, But if it's palliative care where we know that we're not going to be able to turn that around, then getting the support of hospice is just critical. Now, in hospice, one of the things that's important to know is that the family is our patient, mm. not just the person that's ill. And sometimes I have seen heroics done, quote unquote heroics, because the family needed to buy time to come to terms with the fact that their loved one was dying. Mm. The person that's dying may be lined up with it, and it's very clear that they're on their way out. But to give some time to the family to come to terms with it, to have time to say goodbye, to have, have time to work with it, that's equally important. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned that because that was obviously different in the setting of the ICU. You can't even get in there uh, in l most cases if you're just a friend and sometimes a left family, but they're not right. set up for that. Right. Um, what should people know? I mean, first of all, I think you want to buy this book and you can get it by calling, watch the credits and you can get this through Denise. She self-published this book, but it's really, really terrific. It actually was inspiring in some way because a lot of the fears that we have is what we don't know. Mm -hmm. We just don't know. We're afraid of the pain of dying, maybe even more than the actual event. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know you do a great job of here in the book. Yeah, I basically wrote this book to dispel the fears and the illusions about the dying process. And I've kept it short on purpose. I had one family who read this. Their mother was dying, and I gave it to them at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. She died at 9 o'clock the next morning. Had no idea she was going to go that quickly. The f husband and the daughter read this, and even though hospice had been in there, there was something they got from this. She said, after I read your book, it allowed me to be with your mother's death in such a different way, to be with my mother's death mm -hmm. in such a di different way. So there's something that comes through. I've kept it short because I want people to be able to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're going through st a stressful time, you don't want to be reading a book. You want to be with your loved one. Mm -hmm. Somehow it facilitated that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and help me know your question again. It had to do with... Well, the pain. The man, pain, man, yes. Because people, you talked a lot about that. The things that people are afraid of is they're afraid of pain and suffering. They're afraid of being dependent. And um, for those of you who haven't read Tuesdays with Maury, it's one of the best books I've ever read. And he had ALS. And if you read his book, you will go with him on his journey of becoming more and more dependent. And what I've found over and over again is we have fears about how much pain we'll have. We have fears about what it will be to be dependent. And when you actually get to dependency or increased pain, which doesn't usually happen, it's never as bad as we're afraid. Um, I think it's the national statistics are that 5% of the population actually want to have a way to suicide, to do a, a self-suicide, a Dr. Kevorkian kind of thing, because they're afraid 5%. of suffering, 5%. Yeah. Okay. 
and 0.1% of them actually execute their plan mm. because it never gets as bad as they're afraid of. Mm. Maury was beautiful. He talked about being, so, he said, you know, when I have to have somebody cleaning me, we won't use the words that he used on air, but when I can no longer clean myself after toileting, um, he said, that's it. I don't want, that's going to be the biggest, most demeaning thing in the world. And when it happened, he said, you know, it's not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. You know, it's kind of nice to be cleaned and massaged and lotioned. And, and he just held it in a different perspective. So part of it's how we hold it. As far as pain, the pain control and the way of uh, managing pain is so sophisticated these days that that is no longer, should no longer be something that people are afraid of. It's very rare when the pain cannot be managed. Um, I'm glad to hear that. That's a relief. So g describe the setting for people. So if they have, m most people probably, they've maybe been to a hospital, but they've never been to a, an actual hospice setting. What is the setting like if people are residential in a hospice itself? Well, it's, it, we don't actually have that setting here in Santa Fe. Okay. There's a beautiful, I, I moved here from Shreveport, Louisiana, and there's a beautiful um, hosp in, inpatient hospice called um, Grace House, which is just stunning and beautiful, and each person has their private room, and they have a little patio off of that, and the family can come to visit. They can bring the pet. The pet can stay with them. There's a kitchen where the family can fix the foods. It really, they try and replicate the home situation as much as possible. I haven't seen the room here at the hospital. I hope to go this week. That's right. It's a new. It's, it's, it's new. Yeah. It's new this year. Um, but they've, it's kind of like what they've done with birthing rooms. You yeah. know, it used to be a very medical setting, and then they started making it very homey and comfortable for the, all the family to be in a birthing room. Well, now there's from what I would call a deathing room, but it's an end-of-life care room. And um, it's very definitely about making, making sure that the, they're comfortable, that it's a home setting. There is an inpatient hospice down at St. Joseph's in Al Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. Here in northern New Mexico... Um, it's much more about people staying in the, um, in the, possibly in a nursing home bed, and then ho our at-home hospices coming in and providing services. And we can go into all of the nursing homes and um, different facilities here in town. Mm. Okay, so you, you do go into nursing homes. We go into nursing homes. So uh -huh. we go into homes, mm -hmm. and we go into nursing homes. Okay. In your book, you also talk about the different members of the team or the group that comes in you talked about for the family could you outline you know who are all involved because right, it right. sounds like a wonderful well group. one of the things that's important for people to know number one is that if you are 65 or older and you're on medicare medicare picks up the cost of hospice 100 percent so many people mm -hmm. are afraid of how much it will cost them it really is a hundred percent no charge and um in so, in other words, people should not be afraid. If they need help, they know they're dying. That's don't, right. You don't have to go it alone. That's right. You okay. do not have to go it alone. And the sooner you get on hospice, the better. So many people think you have to be on hospice. You, you wait until you're in the bed and practically taking your last breath. No, hospice is for when you're still walking around and you and your physician and your family know you're counting your life in months rather than years. Yeah, no, I think you mentioned here that also you could be still working. You That's can still right. be working and still be uh, yeah. supported by hospice. Yeah. Yeah. That was a total surprise yeah. to me. So the team members consist of the medical director, um, who works very closely with the physician, the patient's physicians. Um, it used to be the physicians were afraid they'd give up control of somebody they've been the physician for for years. No, they get to manage the hospice care. The medical director is there as an advisor to the team and to act as a liaison mm -hmm. between the hospice and the medical community. There's the nurses, the hospice nurses, who will go out and visit anywhere from once every two weeks to five times a week if needed, and more often if really needed. And what do you do? That's what you do. What do you do as a nurse for them? Well, I have my own private practice okay. now, so I'm not working for one of the hospices, but a hospice nurse goes out and uh, does assessments whenever they're in the home to make sure that the symptoms are being managed, that the pain control is adequate, that if there's any nausea, that that's being handled, that the family knows how to turn people because they get too weak to turn themselves, that all the, the, the physical things that happen as we go through this process, that the family knows how to support it, or the care, whoever's the caregivers are, know how to support that process. Mm -hmm. So the nurses do that. They do a lot of education, a lot of emotional support. 
And then we also have social workers who do, whose job is really to look at the family dynamics and provide emotional support as well and possibly act as a, you know, have family meetings so that the different members of the family can really line up to support the process and also have support for what comes up for them as they're looking at the loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. um, there's home health aides that are just gold. They go in and give the most loving care, and they'll go in for like an hour and a half to two hours, maybe three to five times a week to do physical care, mm -hmm. to relieve the family so that the family can be free to be the family members mm -hmm. and not do daily things that other people can do. And then there's the volunteers. Um, the hospice couldn't happen without the volunteers. It just cannot happen. And they become an extension of the family. They'll stay in the home when the family members want to go out and run errands. They'll go out and run the errands so the family members can stay there. They are just exquisite. They'll walk the dog. They'll, you know, trim the garden, do mm -hmm. whatever is needed to support this family. And then we also have the spiritual directors who are a chaplain type person. They're non-denominational. And they're there to address the spiritual needs that come up usually in the setting. Um, we had one woman who said, you know, I don't really believe in God, but, you know, I better get right with him just in case I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. So um, very often there is a questioning about the meaning of life. And they may not have a religion that they turn to, but there's certainly questions about life and the meaning of it that the spiritual director is excellent at working with. So. Oh, that's great. But if they also have, a, are they're part of a spiritual faith community, then of course their priest or pastor or, or rabbi. rabbi or shaman Absolutely. or whatever could be there for them. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Good. That's great. Yeah. Uh, it's a fabulous read. I don't know, if, if you've just joined us, we're talking to Denny, Denny Cope, who has written a fabulous book on dying, the natural process. And it's a very short book, and you can get this from her. Her number and name will be in the credits, and you can contact her to get it. I strongly encourage all of you to do it. Also, for those of you uh, who are struggling with it or have been through it, and you'd like to contribute to a space like that here in, in Santa Fe or any town that you happen to see this in, we encourage you to get a hold of Denise. She will help you in maybe a bequest or something mm -hmm. for to support uh, the hospice movement, even though it is covered by Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and that's and when Medicare. you're 65 years yeah. older, and there's many, many people who are under that age yeah. who may or may not have insurance. That's true. The other thing that I'd like to mention that I that it goes along with your question about pain and people's fears is that two of the things that come up for families the most is fear that their loved ones are starving to death, or that they're dying of thirst, uh, much like the Terry Schiavo case. And I've even heard physicians tell family members, well, we better get an IV going on them because they're going to die of thirst. And I, I just want the world to understand that there's a natural withdrawal from food and a natural withdrawal from fluids that support the dying process. And we, in our compassion and loving, want to feed and give fluid in order to avoid our loved ones having discomfort or suffering. Once we understand that by making them eat or making them drink, that we're actually creating discomfort rather than comfort, mm -hmm. often the families can let go of the need to do that. Once they know they've done everything they can to create comfort, then they can line up with letting go of what they think is gonna create comfort. Mm -hmm. So often we the living project upon the dying what we think they're going through, and we project suffering very often where there is none. Yeah. The suffering's in us, not in the person that's dying. That was an excellent point, because I didn't know that until I read your book about it, so I, I, that's just one of many important points that you brought out that through all your years, how many years you've been doing this? 20. 20 years of experience, and uh, I want to acknowledge the people that supported you while you were doing this, yeah. but you did in this book, because I think that was important. This book is very, very important for people. What else do people want to know? We've just got a few minutes left, and uh, the fact that dying is a natural process, mm -hmm. that they, they, they really have to embrace it, or it's going to make it harder, isn't it? It's going to make it harder. And one of the things that I watch is that I've watched people come into the dying process really scared. I think that's a human reaction, except people who are 85, 95, they're like so ready to die, mm -hmm. a lot of them, that, mm -hmm. it's, that, that they don't run that. But when they're younger, there's really this, oh my God, I'm dying. I'm looking at dying. 
And then once they start moving with that process, that fear seems to give way to a surrender. And once they've surrendered into the process, just like in life, when we stay attached to something and we're holding on to the sides of the river, the bank of the river, instead of going with the flow of life, there's suffering. Mm -hmm. The minute we let go and do the work of surrender, it's not easy then this process becomes so much easier and so much more peaceful. And so our job as loved ones is to support that and to do our own work inside so that we can support our loved ones as they, as they go through that. That's a great point. I wish you'd talk a little more about it. This show is obviously about spirituality. Yeah. And talk about a little more about the spirituality of dying and what you've observed with people. If the people who have a belief system, do they have an easier time of it or a harder time or the people who don't, who holds on, who lets go. Tell us a bit you know, about that. It seems to be very personal. I know people who have had a strong religious background, but they have such judgments, self-judgments about their life that they're afraid they're going to be punished on the other side or they believe mm. they deserve to be punished. Mm. And so it gets real scary to die. And there's other people who don't have any s religious background, but they just go through the process and surrender and they're in a peaceful place. And I have other people who just don't want to let go of life. You know, there, I talk about um, yeah, a great story here. the Tell gentleman me. in here yeah. who, who we were, he, he just looked like he was suffering so badly. He was 50 years old, he had bladder cancer, and, and we were just all seen suffering and we're going, why doesn't he let go? Why is he staying here? And of course, we asked him if there was unfinished business and was there anything keeping him here. And, he, and it, in the beginning, he didn't believe there was anything other than the physical world. Mm. By the end, most people have an experience of a larger reality than the physical world. They start to see people who've died before. They really start to have spiritual experiences, for want of a better word. Well, this guy who's a scientist, didn't believe in any of that. And at the end, he said, oh, no. He said... Um, he said, I've been given the gift of seeing where I'm going. And it's so warm and it's so beautiful. I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to leave here yet. And he was not suffering. He, he, his family told me three years later, they said, do you know what he told us in his last days? And I said, no. He told us that without a doubt, this was the best time of his life. Mm. And he had had a very full life. Mm. So yeah. that's what's available to us. Yeah to choose into. And, be, and we are supported from the other side, from up, down, in, out. I don't know where that space is, but I do know there's a larger reality than you and I sitting at this table. I'm glad you brought that up because, as I mentioned previously in another segment, this is where about a week ago the, the late, great uh, Kubler-Ross passed away. And mm -hmm. I read a lot of her work, and I'm sure, and you refer to her in this book, right. about those experiences and Raymond Moody's work, Life right. After Life mm -hmm. and others, where people do see uh, their loved ones or their, uh, their spiritual deity focus coming to or ensure them. Or entities yeah. that they don't know. I had yeah. one lady, three young men arrived and were up on the wall, and she thought she was losing her mind. And she needed to be reassured. I, and I just said to her, are they distressing to you, or do they make you feel good? She said, no, they're great. I'm glad they're here. And I said, well, I'm glad because they're here for you. And it's part of the process. You're not losing your mind. Mm -hmm. And she went, oh, thank God. Mm -hmm. And then she could relax into it. That was clearly one of the benefits of this book because you did talk about what people need to talk to mm -hmm. dying people about and, and how to help them. Say a few words about that. That was so helpful, I thought. Well, it's, it's just the most important thing we can do for a person that's dying is to listen. If you did nothing else, if you listen, and listen with your heart as well as your ears, and put your agenda to the side, they will tell you what they need, they will tell you what they want. Doing a life review with people is so valuable, but listening to them when they say they don't want to eat, it's okay. When they say they're not thirsty, it's okay. You know, when they say, I really don't want to be moved, and by the time they need to be turned, that's a whole different thing because you really do need to turn people to prevent pressure sores and skin breakdown. Um, but they will tell you what works for them and what doesn't. And, they, and the other thing is that if it's at all possible, 
actually talking about the fact that dying is happening. So often the families go, I don't want to tell them, don't tell them they're dying. And the dying person says, don't tell my family I'm dying. And everybody knows that dying's happening. It's just they're trying to take care of each other mm. and spare each other. Mm. And it's really facilitating that conversation. Mm. Say a few more words about the family, because I think that was something that I didn't realize that much, and I think people need to know. How do you, as a hospice helper or people, work with the family to help in this process? How oh, can I, they be helpful? Yeah, I think my job is much more working with the family than the, than the person that's dying. The person that's dying gets it. Mm -hmm. They really understand their process, and they're having a lot of support from places we can't see and don't know about, or I can't see. Some people can. Um, but the family members don't have this information. They're not getting that support, that in invisible support. And so they need to understand about eating, about drinking. They need to understand their own need, that they're going through a grieving process. And they need support in that and how to do that. And also how to talk and be with the person. I had one woman who wanted to do life review. And one of the ways to do that is to go through old photos. And she had a friend come over. And so she'd tell a story about her photos, and the friend would say, oh, yeah, God, I remember those days. Man, when I did this and this and this, and the friend started telling her stories. Mm. Well, the woman said, listen, I'm the one that's dying here. <laughs> I want my stories listened to. <laughs> you get yeah. your time later. So okay. it's really listening. Yeah. It's so critical. We've only got a couple minutes left, but what about people in this transit society? They're without family. They don't have a support. How do you qualify? How do you know? It's your, how do you find out if it's time well, to you know, go to hospice? One of the things I do is what I call pre-hospice work. And one of the biggest questions that comes up is, how do I know my love, if my loved one's dying? Mm -hmm. And that's re in the early stages, it really can look like depression. So you've got to really sort that out. Mm -hmm. Is this depression or is it really end of life where you're losing your appetite and your interest in the world for natural reasons? Mm -hmm. Is it something that can be addressed and perhaps turned around? Or is it something to be supported? So that's a, that's a time to work with. And I often work with families to understand that as do physicians mm -hmm. okay. um, so it's it's and if and if they're wondering about that they can call any of the hospices and the hospices will come out and do an assessment and okay. help them talk to their physician if they decide they want to pursue hospice care okay that's very good this we've run out of time I can strongly recommend this book dying the natural process by Denny Cope She's in the phone book in Santa Fe, New Denis. Mexico. Denis Cope. Denis. In, in, under C-O-P-E Cope. And uh, if you can't reach her, but look in the credits too. Her name and number and, and uh, address will be there. And her web page, I mean her, her email, email number. So I'm getting a uh, website. Okay, well, this is very wonderful. So thank you for thank your work. You, thank Bill, you for the for work that you me. do. It's and a pleasure. Thank you, too. Well, it's great. It's an honor yeah. to have someone like you come in and show us that we really need to know this. So. I want to thank uh, every, you for watching. I want to thank our director, Marshall, and George for helping out, our camera people, Tom and Wendy, and everybody who's here, our technical support, uh, Ross Bishop, and everybody at home and those who support this, uh, this program, we appreciate it. So on behalf of Denise and everybody here at Spirituality TV, we want to thank you for viewing, and stay tuned next time for another program on spirituality.